I love rainforests. Each time I walk into one, I find something new to watch, discover and learn. Being in such a forest stirs many emotions. And what fascinates me the most is the complexity. Every animal and plant is interconnected. The whole forest is an intricately linked web of life. I've been extremely lucky to work in some amazing stretches of intact forests, but such forests have become very rare. It takes millions of years for something like this to evolve, and yet we can so quickly destroy it. So much of our wilderness has been lost in just our lifetime. Sridhar and I had spent so much time in the wild that it was difficult to just stand by and watch. We wanted to do something that could help change this. What we began was a very small initiative, a chance discovery that led us to find a way to grow forests. We never imagined that one day we would be standing next to the very magnificent trees we planted many years ago. To walk in a forest that you have helped grow is fulfillment beyond words. And yet, our story is of a journey that we had never planned to take. Our story begins at the time when I was doing my PhD. We were working in some amazing rainforests in Kalakad. I was studying civets, a very secretive nocturnal mammal that lives on trees. Civets are very important seed dispersers and I was trying to understand their role in the rainforest ecosystem. When civets eat fruits, they defecate the undigested seeds on logs and rocks. And I had the unenviable job of collecting their poop for my seed germination experiments. We were trying to understand whether seeds germinated better when eaten and dispersed by civets. At the time when I was doing all this, most people thought that it was impossible to grow rainforest plants in a nursery. But I was amazed to find that more than 80% of the seeds we had planted germinated within a few weeks. We were also left with more than 400 tree saplings at the end of this experiment. But we had to move to the anomalies for our next phase of study. So we decided to plant these saplings in an abandoned cardamom estate in Kalakad itself. It felt really good to be planting these seeds and saplings. There was a great sense of satisfaction. The satisfaction you get only when you try to grow something. The years we spent in Kalakad was the best period of our lives. It gave us some really valuable insights on how an ecosystem with minimal disturbance functions and how delicately interconnected the whole rainforest was. But the highlight was our experiment with civet poop and our discovery that we could grow rainforest saplings. Little did we realize that this finding would start us on a journey that would eventually change the course of our lives. The 
Anamalais is an amazing place. It has some really wonderful forests that are filled with wildlife. But we came here for another reason. The Valparai Plateau is one of the most unique landscapes I have ever seen. It is a mix of tea and coffee estates with patches of rainforest in between. This place has a history. More than a hundred years ago, all this was rainforest. But now, the forests look like islands floating in an ocean of tea. In our PhD research, we were trying to understand how wild animals survived in these fragmented patches. Even though, from the outside, they appeared like good forests, the fragments were actually in poor condition on the inside. In most of them, the canopy was very open and the understory was invaded by weeds. These were less than ideal habitats for wildlife to survive. Working in Valparai was very exciting. Not a day went past without us encountering some wildlife in the landscape. It was amazing that these animals had adapted to living among the tea plantations. Many species were now living outside forests because their homes were fragmented or gone. With animals moving outside forests and close to human habitations, there was bound to be conflict. Up to three people were getting killed by elephants every year. There was also other kinds of damage from wild animals. Loss of wildlife habitats is probably one of the biggest issues in conservation. There is so little left that just trying to protect what remains may not be enough. Could we do anything to increase forest cover or at least repair the degraded habitats? We knew it was easier said than done. A mature and intact rainforest is the product of many thousands of years of evolution. They are so complex that creating something like that is beyond human capability. That was the frustrating part. It is so easy to destroy, but almost impossible to recreate. What we saw in Valparai convinced us that we should at least attempt to bring back these habitats. And that was not just about growing trees. We needed to work with many people to get a project of this scale off the ground. It needed the commitment of plantations over a long period of time. Many of the fragments were found inside their estates. We weren't even sure if they would be interested. We've uh, looked at about 18 forest fragments like this one and we have a few more to go. So what's the prognosis been? What has your observations been uh, over these surveys? It's quite variable. So we've surveyed from small to very large fragments and uh, it's good in terms of how many animals are using it but the condition of the fragment itself is very poor in most cases. So can we do something at all? Yeah, because my understanding is that it's very difficult to get these uh, trees to regenerate or to restore these kind of rainforests. Uh, when we were working in Kalakad, we found that we could actually grow a lot of the native rainforest trees. We managed to germinate many of them from civet scats. We also managed to grow them from, you know, seeds collected from the forest. So uh, we have uh, a number of species for which we were able to get seedlings. It surprised even us. So there is a possibility to come back and restore these kind of fragments. We'll start off something like this as soon as possible and then uh, maybe we'll have, one day we'll have uh, hornbills nesting here. <laughs> yeah. We were delighted that Venki was as keen as us about restoring the fragments. We found 
that many of the other companies were also very positive about letting us work on their land. This kind of support was so important for restoration. We finished our PhDs and returned to Valparai to finally start our rainforest restoration project. The first piece of land we got to restore was an open plot given to us by one of the estates. We only knew how to grow saplings from rainforest seeds. We had no idea how to grow rainforest in an open piece of land. There was only one place we could go to learn. A proper rainforest. Working in these forests was amazing. It brought back memories of Kalakad. But what we were trying to do here was totally different from our PhD work. We literally had to deconstruct the composition of a forest by measuring and recording every little detail. By this time, we had also started building a team for the restoration project. It was clear that we needed a lot more people in this effort to recreate a complex ecosystem like a rainforest. At the outset, we realized that the canopy was a very critical element of a rainforest. An intact canopy acts like a protective blanket. It is so dense that very little direct sunlight reaches the ground. The canopy helps maintain a stable environment under which the rest of the forest grows and regenerates. A rainforest also has multiple layers in its structure. The forest floor is humid and moist and covered in leaf litter. It is under these conditions that the rainforest seeds germinate. The shrub layer above the forest floor forms the midstory. It is composed of woody plants that provide spaces for animals that live near the forest floor. Above this is the canopy that forms the cover and has its own unique set of plants and animals. The arboreal diversity of a rainforest is dependent on this layer. The multi-tiered structure of a rainforest is very important. If this is affected, the diversity also gets affected. Our field research showed that even though there were shrubs and trees growing inside fragments, they lacked the structural complexity and diversity of a rainforest. We found that the number of specialist rainforest species decreased in the fragments and they were being replaced by common or edge species of animals and plants. Red whiskered bulbul, two of them, and they come under open. open forest species. With the specialist species gone, the very nature of the fragment changes. It is no more a functioning rainforest. It is a fragment on the path of degradation. Having dense canopy cover was the most critical aspect of a rainforest. Creating that as soon as possible was the primary goal in the restoration process. The architects of the canopy were some amazing trees. They are the pillars of life of a rainforest. Their presence was so inspiring that it pushed us even more to take on this journey. My personal favourite among these trees are the figs. They are the supermarkets in a forest. Many animals and birds come to feed on them, particularly hornbills.
great hornbills are excellent indicators of a quality of a rainforest. My dream was that someday we would revive a fragment to be good enough for great hornbills to start using them. It would be a sign that our restoration work was successful. Hornbills are among the best seed dispersers in the natural world. A service we could use as finding seeds for restoration was a challenge. The seeds of rainforest trees have to overcome many challenges before they can eventually grow into a mature canopy tree. Every seed that falls to the forest floor is invaluable for the regeneration process. This meant that even though we required seeds for our restoration work, collecting them from inside the forest was not an option. We had to find some other way. We realized that we could collect seeds along roadsides and forest boundaries. These seeds had little chance of surviving anyway. We got a high diversity of seeds for restoration on par with the mature forest, but at the same time, we did not have to collect from inside forests. It was good to have seeds to start with, but we could not plant them directly in the restoration sites. Most of them would not germinate under the open conditions in the fragments. We needed to raise seedlings. And for that, we had to go back to where it all began for us. Our little discovery about growing rainforest saplings set us on this journey of restoration. And here we were again, trying to grow saplings from seeds. But now, it was at a much larger scale. We were really lucky to gain the support of the plantations for this. Because they were planters themselves, they already had the infrastructure and they generously allowed us to use it. Some of the very knowledgeable and dedicated plant handlers were from the local communities. Their insights and constant care helped build a large enough collection of saplings for us to plant or distribute locally. With over 150 native species, the nursery became a precious repository of starting material for a future rainforest. Every restoration site had its own unique characteristics. We had to select the right species based on the altitude and slope and other parameters of each site. It's going to be a tough plot, very open. I think many of our rainforest uh, saplings are not going to make it if we plant them. Most rainforest species are shade loving. When planted in an open area, exposure to the sun can affect their survival. Maybe while planting we can make sure that all the cleidodendrons are not uh, cut. To protect them in the early stages, we had to create cover by enabling fast-growing native species to establish. These are pioneers, species that are well adapted to open areas. But there are many species that we could possibly put in, I think. Yeah, probably like Actinodaphne, I think will do well. Mm -hmm. And maybe even things like Olia. The knowledge we gained from working in an intact rainforest became invaluable in our restoration process. Besides open areas, we also planted within many degraded fragments to restore them. The monsoon was peak planting season for us. Over the years, we worked on restoring numerous sites across the Valparai Plateau. The first few years were the most challenging. We suffered losses from unexpected quarters. But there was so much to be learned from these difficult times. Over two decades, we restored more than 17 different sites. We planted more than 100,000 saplings, of which nearly 60,000 have survived to become young trees now. So far, we have restored about 70 hectares of rainforest fragments. 
and the transformations that happened were amazing. The canopy, which was so open in these fragments, has vastly improved. An increase from 20% cover to 60% cover means that the microclimate within fragments became more humid, cooler and stable. Conditions that are closer to a rainforest. The density of trees has also shown a remarkable increase. The fragments were getting thicker and denser. With more rainforest tree species coming up after restoration, the overall species richness has gone up. An increasing diversity is also a good sign of a recovering forest. We were finding more and more saplings within the restored sites. These saplings had come up on their own, not planted by us. A sign that natural regeneration had begun. The Stanmore fragment is where it all began for us. It was an open piece of land. It is now a young forest. In all our restored fragments, as the trees grew, the rainforest animals began to reappear. With more leaf litter and foliage forming, insects appeared. And to feed on the insects, many animals followed. As saplings grew into small trees, animals like Nilgiri langurs and giant squirrels reappeared on the leafy branches. After 15 years, when some of the trees began to produce fruit, lion-tailed macaques came to feed on them. As the shade increased, the weeds disappeared and the forests became more moist. The streams in the fragments began to hold water for longer periods. It was gratifying to see the return of so many creatures we had never seen in these sites before. What was even more gratifying was to see how the connections between plants and animals revived with restoration. The animals ate the fruits and dropped the seeds which now began to germinate. The regeneration is a sign of the future forest. A rainforest that is on the path of revival. We are frequently asked whether growing forests is any better than growing a plantation of a single species like eucalyptus or teak trees. At the end of the day, they are all trees. Our answer is always the same. A tree plantation with one species can never be a forest. With the loss in diversity of species, Plantations also lose the many intricate connections between plants and animals that are the hallmark of forests. Unfortunately, what is reported as increasing tree cover is often only an increase in area under such plantations. These are not habitats that can support our threatened biodiversity. Another global concern today is the climate crisis. We need to urgently reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Planting forests plays a very significant role. The rainforest trees that we planted and the sites we restored have sequestered more than 5,000 tons of carbon. That's the equivalent of carbon emitted by burning 7.8 million liters of petrol. The restored rainforests store more than twice as much carbon per hectare as unrestored fragments and eucalyptus plantations. As scientists, we are often called to justify the need for preserving our wilderness and in our case, the need to restore forests. In our many years of working in the Anomalies, we've had the chance to observe, restore and measure the numerous and critical benefits of growing forests. 
It is a great challenge to explain the tangible benefits of having forests. But more than ever, we are at a point where we need to prioritize the environment and work towards its preservation. We were lucky to find like-minded people in the T estates whose incredible support made all the difference to our restoration efforts. For almost everyone involved, it was a leap of faith. Having to wait for so many years to see any visible results. But I guess each of them found gratification in their own things. Venki's undiminished support has been the foundation for so much of our success. Watching a Malabar grey hornbill nesting in the restored fragment within his estate has been his moment of reckoning. For others, it was not only about having beautiful forests and wildlife on their properties, but also the fulfillment of their corporate social responsibility. For most people who have been associated with the restoration work, the greatest satisfaction comes from the fact that there have been growing trees and reviving rainforests. As for us, every time we visit our restoration sites, I always feel a surge of emotions. They have changed so much. Many of them are unrecognizable now. They look so much like a proper rainforest. Some of the trees we planted have grown so tall and are fruiting. So many animals use them. I always wonder what I would be doing if I hadn't done my experiments with civet poop. If we hadn't discovered that we could grow rainforest trees. I used to dream of studying hornbills. But nowadays I'm equally attached to the trees that they come to feed on. Every monsoon when it is planting season, there is only one thing that I wake up to. A dream of trees.